I don't want to stereotype myself that I should put like Buddha and bamboo on the wall because I'm a Vietnamese restaurant. Uh, my house in Vietnam was from the 70s, so it's kind of modern, modern building, modernism. For me, Slandor is really about bringing a piece of Vietnam to you and perfecting the craft, right? I remember eating Bò Luc Lac in Saigon in 1992. You know, it was, it was something I didn't have as a kid. And I just knew the only difference is I knew American would not want to overcook beef, right? They want a medium rare. And I was just looking for cheap meat to buy. Back then, the, these butcher's house would make these fillets for airline. They have a medallion. So a fillet have a head and a tail, and they can't really use a tail. And I was paying it like a dollar a pound, you know? A dollar a pound, and it's 100% yield, so it's all clean. And I cut little pieces, I use the same recipe, and the rest is history. Charles Vaughn, the guy who started Slander Door, founder, we have the Slander Door Group, um, a few restaurants in San Francisco, California. Welcome to the Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all over the world. Um, well, first of all, thank you. Super happy to be here. I don't get to interview by Vietnamese very often. I, I, I should reach out to more <laughs> Vietnamese people. Obviously, Vietnamese is very dear to me. Uh, I was born there, um, you know, and left in 75 uh, on a boat and came to the U.S. And here I am, still cooking. Yep. What does it mean to be Vietnamese to you today? Super proud, but also feel like there's is a responsibility to promote our culture, our people. I guess I always had a little chip on my shoulder. Uh, how people see us and how people see just Asian in general, our, our, our food, uh, aesthetic, our design. So Slander Door was really born from, from all that observation. During the time that you grew up in Dalat, uh, you weren't thinking about becoming a food person. No, I think about food a lot, but I wasn't thinking about food person. Um, you know, we were not allowed to be on the street as the war got tougher and dad started making some money. So I was locked up and I would load these baskets for the street vendor to buy food. And all I remember about Vietnam is food. I, I never thought of um, want to be a chef. I, I do know I'm bad at school. I do know I'm bad at uh, reading and writing. It doesn't matter what language we're talking about. So <laughs> obviously I'm bad in English, but uh, in Vietnamese, I'm just as bad. I think my dad like sent me to tutor both Vietnamese and Chinese. And as you know, in Vietnam, uh, they have a ranking system. There's 60 kids. I remember, and I never made past 35. So I'm, I'm like on the bottom 50 percentile. And even though I got all the tutor, but but I love to draw. I love to uh, make things with my hand. And I remember in Dalat, it was a lot of craft, you know, uh, because there's a tourist, you know, kind of like Tahoe light and, and they would have these little pine tree, they carve in it or, uh, or they make balsa wood and cut a little figurine and, mm. you know, daffy ducks on there and you sell them to the tourists. I love that stuff. I love making things. Um, what's brought, uh, there weren't a lot of toy, and 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 we would make stuff and um and finally i think one of my one of us got chicken pox and we were locked up and my my mom bought me a metal airplane and by the time i finished chicken pox the airplane is completely disassembled uh, i like to take stuff apart and mm. <laughs> then i have a little motor with the battery operating i was making something else with that so it's hard for me to kind of accept the fact that uh, you didn't do well in school. So how did it, how did it all, how did that all work out? I, I think, I think some of us just really less disciplined. If something I don't like, I just don't do. And in fact, I never graduated from Berkeley because I have a few more classes of like math 1A and physics 1A I never took because I hate those classes, but my architectural classes all, I aced those out. So, so I think, you know, um, I, I think, 
that's just how most people are built. You know, we all kind of have our uh, bandwidth and what we're interested in. And, and, and I think uh, it's the most important thing. I have three kids and, and I pray to God, my son is interested in something. <laughs> I got into Berkeley in 1982, um, um, my mom had fixed my age uh, in mm-hmm. Vietnam, so I'm in the military. So on paper, I was two years younger. That gave me a little heads up. Um, so I came into Guam at seven, sixth grade, seventh grade. So I tried to catch up in English. Um, and I got into Berkeley. Um, and I started working in a restaurant. And and I was different. You know, Chinatown was rough. You know, there were a lot of gang. And the the people that from Chinatown, the local was wasn't very nice to the the immigrant, you know, of our own people. So you know, San Francisco at the time, I was bused to the Mission District, and um, and it was very mixed crowd, you know, and and literally you have every every ethnic group fighting whatever the flavor of the day is is between the Filipino and the Mexican. And next day is the Chinese against the black. Oh, it's just, it's just like there's no, no one dominant uh, group, you know, and everybody was poor. So there's a one common denominator. But but when I got to Berkeley, that's when I really felt like, oh, my God, like this is uh, so different. These people are wealthier. They didn't think differently. So that's when I started feeling a little bit more oppressed when I was in Berkeley um, you know, in San Francisco, I just feel like, well, you know, the ABC, yeah. the, Amer- the American born Chinese, I'm not sure if that's a bad word, but, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, they weren't very, weren't very nice because very, you know, you have to imagine 70s, you don't have the right shoes and right clothing, then you don't fit in. Um, so you always had the, the minority kid hang around, um, then I got to Berkeley. That's um, I was continue working in Russia. I, I want to be an artist. Um, I was studying ceramic. I did a lot of ceramic work. I was going to go to art school. Um, then, you know, Mission High was rough. You know, and and I remember would find out these application for these competition in a trash can because the teacher doesn't even believe anybody's going to use it. So often I would enter these competitions by myself. So I was always self-starting. I remember did an AA competition in my senior year. And um, it was due the, the next day. It was prom night. So I was building my model in a tuxedo uh, wow. after my, my, my. Um, so I think the, the, I always want to do design and I settle architecture because dad was very upset that I wanted to be an artist. So, so I ended up, um, getting into Berkeley, I really want to go to New York, and and I was flirting with Cooper Union uh, or St. John. Um, anyway, um, I was the oldest kid, so I settled in San Berkeley and left Chinatown, moved moved to a big uh, co-op uh, in Berkeley, uh, Barrington Hall, and you know, um, and and you knew that architecture would be the path for you to kind of appease your dad? Uh, yeah. I mean, it would sound like, yeah. like an engineering job, but, but, but I liked it and Berkeley really transformed me. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get a professor, a guy named Joe Eshrick. Um, he's sort of like, he looked like Yoda, you know, like taking you around with a bunch of kids and there's no homework. He just talked. And really just kind of set my ways of how I think about architecture and art and, and, and really that, that major really helped me throughout my life of just breaking things down, solving problem and, and looking at design, looking at proportion. And I always have been a visual person. And, but the, the, the food thing starting to, you know, I was not a normal kid, right? I was drinking espresso and eating croissant in high school. I would ride my bike to from Chinatown to Mission, and I would uh, drink espresso at just dessert. And back then, they were popular. And read the New York Times before I go to school. You know, mm. I would drink Calistoga water, and everybody drink, drink soda. I was definitely not normal, and I think it's because 
I was brought up with really great food in Vietnam. I remember complaining about the butter in San Francisco because it didn't taste like the butter we had in in Dalat. Um, as a kid, I used to run to the bakery, pick up fresh baguette, and put French butter and sugar in for mm. breakfast. Or or the uh, the roast pork lady would come in front of the store, and I get like piece of roast pork, me and my dad, and little soy sauce and baguette and roast pork for breakfast in the morning. So I grew up with really good food. So it was kind of natural that when I went to the restaurant, I was just drawn to those things. And and this is even before Starbucks. So I, I love coffee and constantly want to learn how to cook. And, and, and I remember always asking the chef and watching how they do stuff, but I never work in the kitchen. But the idea was, so I knew about service. I knew about, and, you know, and my dad's an entrepreneur, so I learned a lot from him. So, but, but it was really doing those years in Berkeley, I was just really kind of annoyed the fact that, you know, most Asian kid, like, people say something like, I should go, go to Evans Hall, which is the math the major building. You know, um, and and design wasn't in the forefront, and uh, and um, so so all those years after college, I just saw a niche. I, I say, why can't Vietnamese food be in a beautiful environment, modern environment, with all the service and accoutrement, but the food should be classic Vietnamese food? And it was in my head as an observation. And also, that's a way to kind of want to show off to the world that, hey, Vietnamese people can design. But my main focus has always been on the design aspect of design and Was service. Were there any seeds of the future of getting into the food business? No, not really. Um, I was, you know, got into activism. I was organizing protests. Uh, they increased the uh, tuition from 200 bucks to 400 bucks. I thought that was outrageous. So, so I got into that and um, I didn't finish that year. I moved to New York, worked for an architectural firm. Then I came back and I helped my mom ran her sewing shop. And then I got into sewing shop, then designing clothes. And, you know, mm -hmm. that's a whole nother podcast we should talk about like the sewing shop in chinatown and quote unquote sweatshop and yep. um it was very bad you know these businesses will take advantage of these immigrant and and the law and nobody know what's going on and so i did that from 1984 to 1992 and i grew the business got a clothing store in college avenue and then uh, I remember demoing software and um, a, a, a venture capital firm, Dylan Reed, was giving our company about three million bucks. And I was selling, um, you know, doing the golf war into the Pentagon of these, you know, titling software, uh, you know, animation software. And, you know, that, that did it for two years, went belly up. But Sandor was in my head for about 10 years. So in 1994, um, I was about, you know, unemployed for about eight months and I was going to continue selling software. I was going to move to Brazil. I was selling internationally, really loved Brazil. Um, and um, Brazil feel like Vietnam, you know, just mm -hmm. full of energy, full of people um, and opt to not to do it and decide to open my restaurant. And I, I didn't think about restaurant when I first thought I was living in downtown Oakland and I saw the twin tower federal building went up and, and I would say, Oh, perfect place to put a little coffee shop. And I, I think it's just that all that training is from my father, you know, my father being an entrepreneur, uh, always looking at things like location. I remember in Chinatown, he saw, you know, Broadway, where all the pornography is, and, and Broadway separate the Italian and the Chinese, and no one had crossed Broadway yet. And there was one pornography store uh, on the corner, and he said, that's not going to last. Like, he can see that, 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 that magazine store, and he, he probably doesn't even know what pornography store is. And, um, and he went after it and, and they didn't just give it to him because he didn't have the connection with the local. 
So they ended up buying a sewing shop and, and got con. So, you know, really hard, um, just getting screw over, over and over again. And, and, and all that I can tell, you know, thousands of story about what we went through in Chinatown in the early year, um, you know, it was uh, rough, you know, uh, one story I can tell you right now, the landlord didn't want to buy a lot of garbage can. So he didn't have a place to put garbage. So he went down the street, he put it into some dumpster. Then one night we got this bang on the door because there's some address in there. There was a pile of garbage in our door and the guy pulled out a gun and demanded $400. And mind you, that's the entire month paycheck and, and we had to pay. And I still remember staying in it and just, uh, you know, um, so, you know, um, so I'm back, uh, selling software. I'm done. I was going to do a little coffee shop in Oakland and they, they say, nah, you don't have any experience. And, you know, they don't want me to do that. Cause I never had the, I didn't think I could cook. So I wasn't going to open a fancy restaurant. So I was like, all right. And I was in the mission and I try, you know, back then there weren't any Craigslist or wanted ads. So you would look in the paper and for eight months I was cooking with friends and, and looking at wanted ad every morning and, and have three hour coffee in the morning and look at recipe and cook that at night and, and really just, uh, had a time to really reflect and figure out what I want to do. And I was going to do a little bun sale shop in, in the tenderloin. And this French guy said, no, nah, you got just too many Vietnamese here. We don't want you. You know, he was uh, doing a hostel for your Euro European and I, and I get it right. Like he's, he's, he just tried to service his customer because like everybody else is Vietnamese around him. So yeah. Then I told him, hey, I can cook French food. So, <laughs> but he didn't buy it. So he didn't lease it to me. And it was just like a counter with 12 seat uh, with, you know, two, four top. It was so small. And I thought it would be cool. I could just cook there. And, you know, I was going to model after, you know, Betty Ocean Diner in Berkeley. Uh, so my brain's always kind of working and looking at business angle. And it doesn't, I just don't let the not, knowing part scares me. I just say, I'll deal with it later. So, so we, we found this space. I found this space in Valencia street and it was in a restaurant and, and I just figured, well, nobody wants this. I mean, it's other people wanted it, but I figured I could build it cheap since I have building construction experience. And not only I don't know how to cook, I never built a restaurant. So I just built it. it took me a year credit card and I would go down to the building department um, and this one not so nice guy, he would just make one comment at the time, right? He would say, well, this is wrong. Then I come back with two weeks and he said, why, why can't you just tell me, like, give me a couple more rounds so I don't come back here. But it took me a year, a uh, bunch of credit card. And um, so <laughs> November of 1995, we opened our door, you know? I mean, I literally just had six things on the menu, Mom had this spring roll recipe that I knew was a winner, but I was very clear on what the food was going to be because, because, because by the time I went to college from 1982 to 94, mom would make us get us to come back home. She would make Vietnamese food. And even though we're in Chinatown, we're Chinese, but we're just like miss, uh, like she make bun bao. And uh, I mean, even today, my kid, loves it and they call it circle noodle because they don't know how to speak Vietnamese. They they call it circle noodle and she would make hot bundel and you would assemble uh, your plate yourself or she'll have a spring roll station that you roll it yourself. Um, and, and that was just, you know, she, she was, she wasn't a, a chef and she's actually a businesswoman more so than because she was in charge of our family. Um, uh, business and and at the general store and selling sugar, selling gas, uh, kerosene, that sort of thing. So she wasn't cooking. So I was hanging in the back with, with uh, at the warehouse with uh, the ladies that help her. And later, and I was moved to live with my aunt in Saigon, and she was a great cook. And I watched her cook, and and I start. It's always kind of 
but I pay attention. I just love it. And I didn't realize it was kind of in my head. And, um, and you got these things like do's and don't, which one come first. And you don't even question it just because that's how they do it. You know, you know, you, you heat up the oil and then you wait, the oil is hot and you put the garlic down, then the onion. Like I knew I was just so natural to me. I don't even mm. think about it. And now I teach some young cook and, and they, they put the onion down and instead of the garlic first. And of course, if you do that, you're not going to brown your garlic because the onion's got too much water. So that's where I really develop, you know, all the little nuances. Um, but once I start cooking in 95, I, I was on a roll. I was cooking the lunch and dinner. I would go to the market with my truck. I was pick up everything every day. And because I don't have restaurant experience, I was just doing everything yep. the, the hard way. What, what was the name of that first restaurant? Slanted Door. Oh, you called it the Slanted Door. Yeah, we, uh, so a whole bunch of people getting drunk on my cooking. And I told them I opened the restaurant and people just thought I was crazy. Um, and somebody said, instantly your door slanted. They went and saw it, but the whole wall was slanted. So that's how the name come about. You know, it's a 1950 uh, retail store with a canted, you know, diagonal window front. Um, I, I didn't want to call it a Vietnamese name. I was very conscious of how the stereotyping, even back then I knew, like I, I just instinctively knew how I want to present the story. Um, I don't want you to be tainted and come. And we were doing everything different. We were doing expensive Chinese tea, charging four or five dollars, same price as my spring roll back then. And the Ritz Carlton charged two dollar pot, and my tea was four fifty. Uh, and because I learned from this gentleman a few years before, they were importing really expensive Chinese tea. It was so amazing, and and I can't afford to give it out for free. And customer would get upset. I was like, every Chinese restaurant keep free tea, and I go, well, number one, I'm not a Chinese restaurant, <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> You're not getting free tea. And you need to pay, but it's worth it, you know, and, 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 and the slowly that's how we win the customer over. And now, you know, nobody, people always ask, you know, where's the good tea, where's the good tequila and bourbon and the, the food world changed quite a bit, you know, um, when back then I served six fish, whole fish and four of them come back, people upset crying because they thought they saw the head and, and, and you know, now I serve, you know, 30 fish a night and it's been a few years that ever, it's been 10 years, to, no one ever sent anything back. You know? Yeah. So I, I want to go back to the, the slanted door. Um, the word slanted um, today uh, comes with a, a punch. Um, it, it's packed with some meaning. Uh, there's a band called the slanted uh, or the slant and it's a bunch of Asian guys and at the time that you named it that, it sounds like it was from McCanted Door, right? But was there any kind of impression for, for you? Oh, yeah. Uh, the race thing was right, right up there. And I was a little worried at first, but at the same time, I loved it, right? It's really just like we're going to poke you in the eye and we're going to mm -hmm. confront it, right? Like uh, for me, um, at first, it was like, it's kind of cool, sound kind of cool, but also, oh my God, it's, it's like borderline bad word, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and I just, you know, trust in my instinct. I think, oh, this is good. This is good because it's kind of poking. It's kind of not, it's just dependent. And, and, and if you're old enough, if you're old, like World War II veteran, then you see it as, as a race thing. But if you're young enough, you think it's Alice in Wonderland, everything's crooked, you know? uh the mad hatter is going to come out of it right so so but but i purposely do not want you to think of vietnamese then you start experiencing the fancy wine the modern design then you experience vietnamese it's all purpose driven since day one because like i didn't i don't want to stereotype myself that you know i should put like Buddha and bamboo on the wall because I'm a Vietnamese restaurant, right? That's not, you know, in fact, uh, my house in Vietnam was from the 70s. So it's kind of modern, modern building, modernism. 
if you look at the, the presidential palace, when the tank runs through in 75, you know, a lot of those buildings are from, from the 50s, 60s. So, um, so for me, it's, it's, it, it was important to have that juxtaposition, you know, uh, I want to serve uh, French dessert because uh, I don't think the J would work, you know? Um, so initially it was going to do a simple, you know, kind of pho and bone place because I'm in a very poor neighborhood. Um, but I couldn't help myself by the time at night I started doing fancy dinner, <laughs> I cut out all the bone and, you know, fancy wine and it just took off. How did you know? that this is quality. How did you know in your mind that this is food that is just amazing to where you can build like a big following eventually? Well, it's, it's immediate feedback. I, I would run these special, I would come back, uh, maybe picked up the produce at 10. I would go to lunch service and I would in between lunch and dinner, I would come up with a special. And I, I would put it on the menu with a verbal and I would have people taste it at five o'clock. It would be on the menu that night. And I would test it at home. I'll be the last guy to leave the restaurant. I wash the restaurant down because I have all that background. I know how to bus table. Like it, I wasn't going to leave it to anybody. So I empty out my fryer every night. It's just after 27 years, we never not empty a fryer. Filter it, even the dirty oil, you filter it, you wash your fryer. That's how you do it. And, and those first couple of years, like I was just experimenting different things and, and things, some are bad, you know, like I remember this one curry chicken. I was so embarrassed about it, you know, and years later, this guy's like, oh, I remember the place, best curry chicken ever. I was like, oh my God, like, this is so bad. Um, and, and, you know, to a high school, I would watch Jacques Papin and Julia Child. I was interested in cooking. I cooked uh, my first Thanksgiving dinner for my parents uh, when we got to San Francisco in 1977, where Wedgwood stove and took me three or four days to make this complete turkey kitchen uh, dinner because I want my family to assimilate to this culture. Oh. And my mom didn't trust me. So she had a pot of curry just in case that I screw up. Um, so, you know, cooking was natural to me. Uh, I cook a lot and mom had two jobs. I cooked for the family. Were there other Vietnamese restaurants competing at your level at that time? No, no. I mean, for some crazy reason, just there's not a lot of Vietnamese restaurant period in San Francisco. You know, uh, I think a lot of us moved down to San Jose and, mm -hmm. you know, if you follow the, the, the camp story, Camp Pendleton, um, which is further south, you know, by Carmel, Monterey. Um, um, and yeah, a lot of people went into some of the conductor business, you know. There, there weren't a lot of Vietnamese here, mostly Chinese in Chinatown. And when we opened, was the review was really, they just never saw anything like it. You know, I, I made all the table with plywood, cheap, you know, but... I spend money on the chair because I just, I built everything, you know, I laid the floor, I laid the tile, you know, enough credit cards just to buy half the tile and uh, uh, custom made railing, like whatever we could do it, we were doing it. And uh, I didn't, I have a terrible carpentry skill. So, so these benches doesn't line up. So I put a little metal band on it, like Louis Vuitton or something mm -hmm. to the cover of my mistake. And I, we just make it happen. And, you know, um, on a hot day, the air conditioning was so bad that I just climb on the roof and it opened up all the skylight. <laughs> In the wintertime, it's so cold at five o'clock, 530. And I say, and I just, I'll bring you tea uh, within an hour. The restaurant fills up and the body heat just heat up the restaurant because we didn't really have heat in our restaurant. You know, and um, we keep we keep doing it and changing. Then we lost our lease. We had to go. Then we went to Brennan Street for two years. Also, it was like back to this whole refugee thing, right? I, I got nowhere to go. 
I had to leave um, the the space I have, and you know, the landlord was squabbling with the family internal. I couldn't stay. Then I convinced them to sell the building. Then then I had to fix it to come back. So I moved temporary. I literally just say, all right, I'm just going to move a restaurant down down to Embarcadero, and this restaurant had went out of business. And I bring a walk in. I just use it as is, and we move in. And I even make my staff be the mover. And within a week, we got a restaurant in the uh, by the ballpark, you know. And and it took off. And I was like, oh my god! And people doesn't complain about you know nine dollar pino. I mean, uh, and Valencia Street, people bitch about the nine dollar pino. I was like, great! This is you make more money, and you have people who can sell more expensive things and. And we lost a lease again. You know, we lost a lease. Uh, we thought we we're going to stay. For some reason, this guy just canceled, you know. So I got nowhere to go again. So, so and, you know, and Ferry Building had talked to me about some noodle shop. And it took me four days. I settled down and I went to the Ferry Building. I was like, all right, I'm going to take this space. But you, but you have 48 out and say yes to everything I want. <laughs> so, oh shit! So you had you had the chips. Well, I didn't, but I was so frustrated with negotiating the other deal for six months and nothing gets done, and I got like like I didn't really have a home, and and we you know we were busy you know and no one this is the dot com had crashed nobody wants this restaurant the ferry building sites were going to be two restaurants. And I told him, I was like, I'm ready to do it. And so we we got the deal done. And I opened in 10 months from the time I shake the guy's hand, not the lease, just the LOI. Normally it takes two or three months just to get the lease signed. But we did everything in 10 months and 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 the ferry buildings just changed the whole course. Um, yeah. that year, 2004, I won the James Beer Award for the best chef California. Um, things start, you know, um, you know, we were definitely, you know, uh, you know, people were just, just in love with the restaurant for whatever reason. Do, do you think that, um, when you got to the ferry building, your game increased and your awareness and your taste and your viewpoints, everything just like jumped up or uh it, it, is it just sort of like this you know you just did your time in grade time in service and you know you just got better and you know no was... no we we were like a hole in the wall place sorry so people love that people still love that like it was just really holding the place got no place to move i used to have a burn mark in my arm because there was so little room you turn yeah. around with a hot pan and uh, we moved to Brennan Street, but it was somebody else's restaurant. It was fine. People loved the food. But Ferry Building, that's when I met Oli Lambert. Um, now we become best of friends, and he designed a really modern restaurant. And you didn't see a lot of that at the time. And I got a lot of heat from veteran people you know, telling me, oh, this is too cold, too modern. But it was the first, first time. We have a big build out, expensive build out. The landlord gave us money. And it was my luck too, because the when I got there, everybody wanted the South Side, because that's the size that have the more wealthy people getting on the boat, right? You know, <laughs> back to the boat thing. Um, uh, so the ferry boat on the right hand side, the South Side is Sausalito. And the left hand side is the poor people going to Vallejo. So nobody wants the left-hand side, right? And it turns out left-hand side is the best view because it didn't have this big building blocking the bridge. So so I I just got lucked out, just got opened up with the view and, and it just took off right away. Um, and, it, and it was crazy, you know? Um, how, yeah. how big was it? it, it how many seats was it? So the first restaurant was like, you know, it's supposed to be 50 seat, but we crammed like 90 seat people in there. Then the second one was about 150. Then, then the uh, so ferry building was 200. Yeah, it's like 220. 
yeah. yeah but it was really the first time we built everything from scratch and Oli had not done a restaurant before and and it was just one of the best projects he and i did you know the table was custom made we, we found these wood from the cypress freeway collapsing and we were just so you know i i you know by then everybody knew i was doing a restaurant all these resume coming in and people were saying you know they would highlight their portfolio and they tear out and they highlight the buddha and say i do a fusion restaurant i mean for me fusion restaurant is like f word for me right i was like dude i i love your restaurant i've been there for a year i was like you're an idiot if you've been in my restaurant a year you know i don't like this stuff uh and when i met oli and i say how are you going to do my restaurant he said well you take simple thing and you make it beautiful. And that's what I'm going to do to your restaurant. I'm going to make simple materials. It's going to be beautiful. And I was like, dude, this is my guy. And I, I said to him, I, if I can afford it, I would love to work with you. He said, ah, don't worry about that. And, and we sketch out the next meeting. We sketch out a plan like about an hour. And we just went running from there. And, 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 you know, we just really bonded. And we just see a lot of things the same way. And he's an avid cook amazing architect um and and for me it's it's really about it's been the same thing i've been trying to say for a long time you know like um regardless of your ethnicity right when you build something you have to bring something new to the table and stand above you know people are going to judge you on everything for quality and journey and all design is no different than a vietnamese restaurant you know so so by then, I was a little bit more confident, but I knew from the architectural and service side, you know, I was onto something. You know, we were really early on serving food family style. And, and we were doing a lot of things new, like no one was doing. It wasn't just the food, right? Uh, so in 1995, I marked uh, a gentleman doing my wine list. He was doing all the Italian and Chardonnay. He realized no good. And he switched to Riesling. We become the Riesling king. You know, it, we just don't brag about it. And, and people know that we were doing all this stuff, regardless of whether I'm Vietnamese or not. But I was just in the trenches and I hired the right people. I don't know why. So I, and I just inspired them to say, look, you got to be like me with Vietnamese food, whatever you do. Just, just, you know. And I remember I moved to the ferry building, Brennan Street, and I met dad a voyeur from bar agricole he was running my bar you know this traditional you know when i was in high school you would do like pre-mix margarita mix and all this crap right and i went to him i said i know how to do that but can we just go back to the original like what i do to my food that and he made me the first margarita and it's like oh my god margarita and back then he was so crazy that he wine, he wanted to squeeze the lime one at a time so the oil would permeate above your glass. Right. And 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 you know, we become a craft cocktail. We were doing that before all, you know, all these people with suspender and whisker doing that right now, right? But we were doing that like literally in um 2020. Uh uh not 2020, 20, 2000, you know year 2000 yeah. we were doing that because you know we were we wanted really buy good ingredients we have three bourbon three gin it was all blind tasting very democratic our our well bourbon was pappy i don't know you don't know anything about pappy but pappy bourbon is just most sought after bourbon in the country like you get a bottle of minimum six hundred dollar but in 2004 he was a nobody he hadn't won any war i can get him a 20 bucks and I was serving that with ginger ale down the drain, right? And we were ahead of the game all the time. Amazing. You uh, went back to Vietnam in 92, and subsequently, did you go back often, or the restaurant was just taking too much of your time? No, I, you know, uh, my wife's in Thailand, so we were going back uh, every year with the kid, and I always make a stop in Vietnam. Um, yeah, I pretty much go every year. I was consulting in Japan and even five hour to go back to Vietnam. That's uh, even I'm uh, like the last trip in 2018, I went to Vietnam for two days uh, to, to learn how to make bun me. I was trying to track this guy down and I didn't realize from Japan to 
Ho Chi Minh City's five hour plane ride. Um, yeah, it's, I love it because I go back now, I can really understand, you know, go to places like Hoi An and, you know, to eat these dishes that are, you know, you know, if, how do you know what Mei Guang is? Maybe you don't eat 10 of them, right? Mei Guang could be anything. Mei Guang could be Mei Guang from different guys. So you can't just eat once. You literally have to eat 10 or 15 Mei Guang to figure out what is really, I call it the water table for all these things. And, and, and Vietnam's are changing too. And, and, yes. um, and during the war, I'm from Dalat, so we didn't really go a whole lot of places. And and, and now, I mean, I mean, the the food from the Delta is really interesting. I don't don't go there enough, and um, I, and I I do go. Um, As the modern world is continuing, we are losing all of these recipes. So I I really appreciate. Uh, that ability for you to, to 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 capture the senses of it and then retell it um in 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 the modern world I used to and buy these uh clay pot i love clay pot from china and they're smart industry you know making beautiful things by hand they're not you know just machine made and stupid decal with the same color and over the year as the chinese economy grow it doesn't make sense for them to make these artisan things. Right. So they're going to make thousands of, so even that, like their own culture, they're, they're squashing it. There's no, it's all about making money. It's not about like the old way of making craftsmanship. It's sad. And, and, and I'm sure this will turn around someday and there will be more artisan people making clay pot and so on. But yeah. That's um, the beautiful part of like the Japanese though, right? The Japanese somehow were like, okay, money is relative but let's get the craftsmanship continuing for 100 300 400 years they have companies that last 900 years uh, in japan um it's crazy yeah yeah i i do a lot of work in japan and i just can't understand yeah. how the the amount of sacrifice they're willing to do um of their you know crap. and those crap um you know, me and my son was just looking at Google and there have 150 million people living in Japan and uh, there's 39 million people living in California. So that's a lot of people in that little oh, place, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And and um, and yes, these tradition, you know, uh, not to say that Japanese don't do bad things. There's some, a lot of bad ceramic out there, but at the same time, yes, they, they are fanatic about their, 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 their craft, and, craft and craftsmanship and so on. And, and I think, you know, slowly, like any culture, you know, if you look at the Italian in the beginning, you got, you know, checker uh, cloth table and, and as they make more money, they have fancier Italian restaurant and you're going to see all the influx of, uh, of more people paying attention. I think for the first time, I start seeing a lot of young chef, uh, 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 you know, really believe in their culture and try to expand that right they don't they don't do it like me just old school they want to expand that but yet they they don't just you know just cooking french and you know for a long time that's what they all aspire to do you know go learn how to cook french food and asian it was always like not considered uh the the, the high-end stuff but now they're not and a lot of a lot of american chefs learn how to cook japanese way and yeah. a lot of people now want to cook vietnamese way can i ask you about that uh, pricing um what why is our cuisine vietnamese cuisine not priced up there yet well if you look at my price it's pretty high yeah, i mean you're the <laughs> you're the exception right i mean I'm, you I'm know well smart. like any business right um regardless your race pricing it's always never endings you know try to figure out the glass ceiling so I mean, it, it's not just race, you know, but, but, but there's a lot of stereotype what things should cost. Right? How do you, so why do you think you broke free from that glass ceiling? Because I, um, if you present the quality and you take the time to explain to them and you got everything else to back it up with, in other words, the service, the wine, the fancy table, they say, okay, I'm paying for the glassware. I'm paying for the service, right? But 
I'll give you an example. Uh, shaking beef, it's my, it's half a pound of filet. I was telling you a dollar a pound. That was a long time ago. Today, I pay $16, you know, with a 28% waste. So it's, it's a lot, you know. So, um, so by the time I'm done with it, my cost is like close to $20 before I can sell it to you. So I'm selling it at, at 45 bucks, right? That's a half a pound of filet. Now you go to a fancy steakhouse, that steak could be half a pound, could be $75. It's all perception because now they, they, they see steakhouse. They just think that they're going to spend a lot of money. So you got a little bit of that. But, but yes, because uh, we have a lot of prejudice towards pricing, what we think it should be. Uh, but that thing is changing, you know, like Japanese food, nobody said Japanese food. Like the first thing you can come out of your mouth is going to be expensive. Nobody blinks. You know? Yeah, because you probably don't want to eat one dollar sushi anyways. <laughs> Gotta know where that come from, right? Like, like if I'm telling you all sushi is like a dollar piece, it's like, Lord, where does this come from, right? Like, you're not gonna me, eat right. that. <laughs> uh, yeah, you give it for me free. Uh, I'm just gonna look at it. Uh, so, so pricing, it's a. Um, I, I don't want to blame everything on the race. Definitely, uh, people do. You know. Um, but what I saw over the year, so I, I served sandwich for $16, but me, right? But the comment was like a little high for a sandwich because they're not, they used to pay $5 sandwich, you know, $5 subway, whatever, right? But all the comment below that, like you see Vietnamese people, oh my God, it's the best sandwich I ever had, best but me. And he makes his own ja, he makes his own pate. I literally make my own pate, my ja, uh, my Thank chicken liver are. mousse. I make mm -hmm. my own mayonnaise. Like I literally make everything for that sandwich, right? I mean, then uh, you just know that you're, you're paying for um, a premium product, right? So, so, you know, you could go to Lee sandwich. It's just like a regular product. I'm a premium set, you yeah. know? So I'm not a luxury, I'm not, I don't have a $90 sandwich yet. Maybe someday I would have yeah. a $90 sandwich. <laughs> when are you uh, opening up at the ferry building? Hopefully by the end of, probably in the spring, you know, uh, major construction, you know. Um, yeah, the business, you know, the restaurant business has been really hard. The staffing issue, yeah. cost of good. And, um, Do you think all of that will return to the old days? You know, um, um, it, it's the old day is not exactly good either. You know, uh, we have, I'm glad you said uh, that, uh, I'm uh, glad. you know, we were that, doing like, a lot a of, mistake. yeah, uh, that it was a lot of volume, like, but you know, the staffing, the pay rate, we'll do another podcast, talk about money and staffing yeah. in front of the house, back to the house, but COVID changed that right now we charge 20% service charge, right? Uh, we tell them, it's like, look, like we need to, you know, in my sandwich shop, I put a 20% on there because I want to pay my sandwich maker a tip. And part of that is living wage. It's just different how you calculate it, right? Like it's just, you cannot make 15, 16, 18 bucks an hour minimum wage and live in the city. I don't care how poor you are. Like that's not even uh, how, yeah, yeah it's not There's doable. No so, so the tip had gone up because people adding a little bit more. Uh, it's because the law in California doesn't allow you to pay the front of the house, back of the house, all this screwed up. So now we go to the service charge that allow me to dictate where the money go. We'll take a little bit of money out of the waiter. It's, it's hard because the waiter used to make a certain amount of money as yeah. much as they want to change, you know, but just finding that balance, uh, finding a balance and, and people start accepting things going to cost a certain amount. And with the inflation, that changes whole this whole thing. It's crazy. Yeah. So it's hard to say, but but I think that I hope that you know at some point, you know, people can't really work from home anymore. They need to go back to work so that you will have happy hour. Uh, right now we don't have happy hour. <laughs> no happy, no happy anywhere. Uh, because they work from home and and they get sick of home homes, so they travel like crazy on the weekend, go to Napa, go to the country, and have staycation. And hopefully, you know, we get back to our normalcy, uh, that little balance, you know. Um, 
maybe you stay home one day a week. I'm not, I'm not suggesting you just come to work every day and go back to the traffic, you know, but at the same time, you know, um, yeah, this this industry is one of the few unlucky industry, you know, yeah. that we got hit the most. We uh, uh, this is the only business got shut down, or well, not only business, but it got shut down. Right, one of the first, yeah, yeah. And 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 if you in tech, you still can work. You you allowed to work. We right. can't work. We're exposed to all these disease because we have to go out and we're not getting paid with less money. Right now, every restaurant is 20, 30 percent down because nobody goes out after eight o'clock. So. Yeah. So, so, but you can't rush these things. People do what they do. Um, it, it tells you how fragile the whole system is and how people, you know, you change their pattern. It's very hard to get them back to a certain other pattern, but, but, um, you know, I'm just like a refugees and I'm just going to keep trekking until, yeah. until I can't yeah. trek anymore. I, I feel like we only had several touch points that I, I wanted to go deeper into, but I know that I, I have like a lot of things that I want to hear from you. And I'm glad uh, that, you know, that, that you have so much to say. And I didn't, ha I didn't, I didn't get to ask, you know, 70% of my questions, but I got a, a real good picture. And, you know, I think the audience gets a, a real, wide base of who you are and then coming back uh, year after year to talk about different developments in the uh, food industry is something that i'm wildly fascinated about yeah thank you i'd love to come back and i really need to understand and learn more about our people you know uh the vietnamese community because um obviously you know we're not monolithic and and we're just so many of us in different places and I remember I was doing a, a, a campaign ad doing Trump uh, administration. Um, uh, this one group asked me to do a kind of anti-Trump ad. Um, it was so interesting. I never, uh, I don't remember seeing the January 6th insurrection. I see all these Vietnamese flag. And I was like, what was that? <laughs> I was like, I thought I was seeing double, you know, there was some like uh, Arizona flag with a little, little snake. And then and the Vietnamese flag was just as big and run across there. And I was like, holy moly, what's going on here? Like, like, you know, and it's interesting to, to really understand why that stuff is happening. It's interesting because it is, uh, and, and we are, you know, I don't, I don't want to hear them make a lot of judgment about those things, but, but, but I think, at least for ourselves to really understand where where all that stuff is coming from you know and, yeah we're, um, we're not a monolith you're right it's yeah it's, we there and even within the republican or the democrat parties they're very different um that people that exist there's different shades and different nuances of yeah people and i um i don't like it when um you know the progressives or the conservatives take a, a harsh stance like the, Amer the way the American political system is turning out to be. We we have to see things for, for all of the different little nuances that whether it's Vietnamese in Vietnam or Vietnamese in Germany or Vietnamese in America or Vietnamese Trump supporters, Vietnamese Biden supporters, there's so many different yeah. variations of who we are. And I think exploring by conversation, the more we talk uh, at, you know, for me, uh, long form podcast is is everything because we get to really experience each other and other people get to experience who Charles Fatten is and I yeah like my my dad refused to go back to Vietnam you know he, yeah, he that's he, sad he, right right like he passed away he just he hated what had happened to yeah. him in Vietnam and he would never step foot back in Vietnam since 75 and we had a lot of opportunity to take him back and he was Won't so bitter about the whole thing about losses his yeah. business and home and and, and you know, and and I I I find it really fascinating. You know, now I'm older. I just turned sixty, and um, and and try to imagine what it was like when he was forty two, when he left. Uh, I think he's forty something. No, no, no. He he was fifty years old when in seventy five, something like that. And 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 how my mom like at her age and, and, and we, she went back to the house right uh, after we found the boat to leave and she went and grabbed all the baby formula, you know, to bring on the boat. I was just like genius, genius. Right. I mean, how, how, I mean, I don't think this woman even had an education and for her to go back to the giant warehouse, we got 
wine, booze, and everything. She grabbed some clothes, all the baby formula. She put it in a bag, right? She emptied it out so people can't rob her, lose powder, like you know, put it in a plastic bag and a couple, you know, sausages. And that powder was our only bargaining thing on the boat. On that boat, nobody wants your money. The money they were throwing overboard because that money is no good, right? And you can have all the gold you can. And nobody like like so you, we would give some powder to get to yeah. use a pot to boil the water. And and they were just like it just go chilled to my bone, you know. First year back to Vietnam, I saw that yellow can and the you know at a at a, a antique store. I bought it and I treasured it, right? It was the same can that she bought, this baby formula, you know? I was like, I mean, it seems like she'd been camping before or something. I'm sure she'd never been camping before. <laughs> like, like how, like you, her brain, and, and that's how it's amazing. When she's calm, and, and I think like, like I see this in and out again from my family, my aunt, my mom, you know? Because a lot of men are, are not in the picture. They're in the jungle. My uncle, is, it's part of the CIA. He's always touring. And, you know, my aunt, you know, cooked for me a little bit. And she would get, get on her motorbike, little Yamaha raincoat, selling cigarette in La Ba. You know, um, it's just there. Yeah, it's amazing if you actually come back and you kind of judge them right now, just on the service, like, you know, when the school, you probably don't have internet, probably had no TV. You just everyday survival. And she just got it down. She got it down to all these ways. And I don't know, you know, how my dad find an apartment in Chinatown. We got here in the Tenderloin, like, you know, we got in the Tenderloin. We, we lived in, in two studio and, um, and next thing you know, the apartment manager set the building on fire and then we lost a bunch of stuff. Like it wasn't just the, the, the Vietnam war, you know, we got mm -hmm. to Guam, we lived for a year. Then the typhoon Pamela came and blow our house away. We're back into the Red Cross line. <laughs> and, and you know, and, um, yeah, these stories just, you know, uh, but they did, it didn't stop them at all. Like they didn't, it was ever bitter. I don't think I ever see them. I'm sure they mess them up bad. And, and, and you know, listening to these stories, I, I, I worry less about my children now because, you know, no matter how hard they get it, it'll never be as hard as our parents. It, it's just impossible for that. Yeah. I, Unless... I would love to have you back on in the spring. Um, you know, when I know it's going to be busy for you to, to reopen and everything, <sighs> but, uh, you find some time uh we'll get back on and you know i really appreciate you coming on today and i looked uh, i was really looking forward to it and i'm so glad that we we had a chance to sit and talk i enjoyed it very much thanks for having me um it's been a pleasure and uh we shall continue thanks charles we uh and hopefully maybe a, a sundance thing that we talked about uh you know earlier this year and you know, get the party out there <laughs> sounds good i love for right. party all right. Thank you, All right. Have Bye, a great man. one. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to The Vietnamese with Kenneth Nguyen. The Vietnamese is produced by Brittany Tran. Special thanks to Jane Nguyen, Catherine Nguyen, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Christo Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at The Vietnamese Podcast. You can also find us on YouTube where you can subscribe, like, and comment. Please rate and give us a review wherever you find our podcasts. Thanks again for listening.